Welcome to Books on Air, the podcast that tells the story behind the book. It includes insights from authors about how they compose their work, what inspires them, and what they hope you'll take away from their book. Here's your host for this episode of Books on Air, Suzanne Harris. Welcome to the Books on Air podcast. I'm Sloan Fremont filling in for Suzanne Harris. This is the podcast where listeners get the secret story behind every book. Joining me today is Mary Mock, author of the book, Wild Colts Make the Best Horses, The Intrepid Life of Abigail Adams. This book is an invitation to walk in the footsteps of the strongest and most influential woman of the American Revolution, who was both a wife and mother of a United States president, Abigail Adams. As Ben Franklin exited the Constitutional Convention, they inquired of him, what have you given us? His profound reply was, a republic, if you can keep it. Abigail fought for this ideal to ensure freedom survival throughout her lifetime. We're definitely seeing a resurgence of interest in history, and Abigail Adams is certainly a figure we can all be thankful for as we think about really how our Constitution and our freedoms were shaped. Mary's book goes right to the heart of this and shares the journey of Abigail's correspondence before, during, and after the birth of our nation, and highlights the hardships endured by the patriots to cement America's values of liberty and justice for all. Mary, welcome to the Books on Air podcast. I'm so glad you're here. Hi, Sloan. Hi. So let's start out maybe by telling the audience a little bit about yourself and what led you to write your book, Wild Colts Make the Best Horses, The Intrepid Life of Abigail Adams. Well, throughout my formal education, including college courses, there was never any mention of a woman involved in the struggle for independence except for Betsy Ross. Mm -hmm. Now, it was a personal decision of mine to document her life, since my life actually mirrors her in many aspects, even though it's 200 years before. I hope that we can get students and, and citizens interested in learning about history, that they encounter teachers who make it come alive, mm -hmm. and that our history is presented fairly, including its strengths and weaknesses. Now, at this divisive time in our nation, I really need to know that everyone can understand and grasp the ideals that liberty was, was originally based on. And I wanted to leave my grandchildren with a legacy of love of history, love of their nation, and a love for the written word. Mm -hmm. Amazing. I love that. I love that. So as I mentioned, the central focus of your book is Abigail Adams. So maybe we can start out by um, having you briefly tell us about her life. Well, she, she was the strongest, most influential woman, as I've said. Should I give you a few of events that, that would have happened in her life? Sure. Yes, please do. Okay. Well, maybe about the strange title. Well, Abigail was tutored by her cherished grandmother, Quincy. And her parents were really concerned because this child was vivacious, outspoken, and so determined. But grandmother Quincy reassured the parents who said to them, wild colts make the best horses. <laughs> so I thought this title so beautifully described her personality that I should use it as the title. Mm -hmm. Now, there are so many fascinating events that happened in her life. One of them would be the Battle of uh, Bunker Hill, which occurred nearby in Boston, which resulted in the burning of Charleston. Okay. Mm -hmm. Now, it was a retaliatory effort, of course, against these British, defiant British subjects. So Abigail, hoping to impress her young son, takes him by the hand up Penn's Hill so he can witness and see and hear and smell the atrocities. Were. Now, while they were doing that, they were informed of their really very close friend, Dr. Joseph Warren, who was just 34, was butchered. At the oh. Battle of Bunker Hill. In mm -hmm. fact, they actually mutilated the body brutally. Oh my okay, another one, just to show her dynamic nature. When John was attempting to persuade the delegates that we have to sever our ties with Britain, Abigail was home alone in 1776, and she would always have to take care of the farm and the homestead. When John was actually away for 10 years, when she was raising the young children, well, she independently made the decision that her children, all four and her, must be inoculated for, for smallpox because it was just raging through the area. 
Mm -hmm. So they were subjected to this very barbaric inoculation process. And little Charlie, age six, had to be inoculated three times and became delirious with fever. So Abigail spent two weeks at his bedside vigil. Mm -hmm. And their daughter, Nabby, at just 11, had a thousand pustules all over her face and body. And of course, this often scarred, and it did scar her later in life. It was still there. Mm -hmm. Okay. And one more thing I want to say about her. She was um, a hands-on mother and a hands-on patriot. John wrote her that we need gunpowder and ammunition because of this ragtag army was just not prepared. Mm -hmm. Experimented with urine and rainwater at the farm and concocted her own gunpowder. Little John Quincy recorded in his journal that she even molded bullets in her own kitchen. So those are just a few things. (laughs) Wow. What an amazing, amazing woman. And I love that you're, you're, you chose to focus on this with your book. Like you mentioned, there's not a lot of um, stories, recorded stories in history about strong women during that time. So I love that you've taken the, this, um, you know, you've taken her story and brought it to life for other people to understand and learn about. Yes. I, I, and I I base it on all on facts, you know, Mm -hmm. like, so I always try to bring in her own words or John's own words to, to back up what I say about this. It's a very, very much of a miracle that he left for France and he left for Philadelphia and, and they corresponded. So we have a firsthand account of the things that happened in the revolution. So right. it's not just for girls, it's for men, but it really shows the sheer sincerity of these men to get it right. So there would be justice and, and liberty for future generations. Right. And so during this time, I mean, we think, um, you know, sometimes we think we have it hard, but listening to what you're talking about, you know, what they went through during that time, um, there was so much danger that the founding fathers faced. Can you tell us a little bit more about what it was like during that time for them and how their persistence really helped to shape our country today? Well, like I said, the, the founding fathers, those would be the delegates. And of course, soldiers were away from home so much that the women had to do hands-on things in the farm and in the homestead. And the men, they could have been hung for treason. They knew that. When they were meeting in Philadelphia, they knew if some British militia came into that room, they would all be hung for treason. Many of them had family members threatened. They plundered and burned their farms and homes, some some of the founders. So when they were done, with birthing the nation, they came home and everything was destroyed. Mm. So it was, it was an amazing time. One more, I'd like, like to say that John Adams was head of the board of war. So they were expecting their sixth child and John wanted to be home for that. But Abigail, two days before the birth had a, the baby she could feel was struggling violently in her inside of her. Mm -hmm. Well, two days later during labor, this is typical Abigail. She wrote to John while she was in labor and then their long awaited baby daughter who they were just so waiting for was a stillborn and mm-hmm. she had to write to him. And when mm-hmm. I had to read these letters, I mean, I sobbed. She was like my best friend for nine years, you know? Oh yeah. And so she had to write him and she had to bury that child without her best friend nearby her. So right. it was it, the things these people endured for this nation. And she was such a, a patriot. She would have done anything for this country. Right. And I imagine in your research, reading those letters and, and feeling like, um, like you said, the firsthand accountant, you feel like you're, you, you're there or you become a part of that, that time. And, um, and you also mentioned that you felt like your life mirrored a lot of her life as well. Do you want to talk about that a little bit? Oh, uh, yes, I would, because we we did have very, very, um, very, very similar backgrounds. Uh, We both had two boys and a girl. I have endured tragedies and by her faith and my faith, we got through it and we our birth order was identical Mm -hmm. and we have both had issues with alcoholism in the family, not myself, but in the family and her son died at age 30 of alcoholism. 
her last son also became an alcoholic later in her life. Mm. And her brother was an alcoholic. But what, what I want to say is we both have, have a passion for this nation and the future mm. because I was a history teacher. This, is, this was her life. So we have many, many uh, of the same values. And when I would read her words, it was just such tragedy that I just became very involved in it emotionally. Right. I'm sure it sounds like it. And again, like, like I said, like reading those letters firsthand, because um, often throughout history, these types of, you know, letters, documents, the actual account of what's happening is lost, or you only have a part of it, or, you know, it doesn't really tell the full story, but it sounds like in your research, you were able to really dig in and and get, um, you know, get to how it really was during that time. Yes. Abigail really loved to write. That was her main recreation, but she would read and reread John's letters, but John would say to her, you have to keep these letters, you know, that I'm going to keep these letters. And she would say, please burn these. (laughs) So people don't see my bad spelling or see my ignorant thoughts or whatever, but her, she was a fabulous writer and she could quote Pope and Milton and Shakespeare within her letters. She often did that or the Bible, but she um, did this. I want to emphasize without one day of formal schooling, she mm. was able to do this because she was so well tutored by her grandma and her father, who was a minister. So mm-hmm. women could not go to school at that time. They could not own property. Uh, they could not vote. And she was so far ahead of her time because she was for the abolishment of slavery. She wanted women to be able to participate in government. She understood that just being home with the children sometimes isn't enough Mm -hmm. for somebody who has other thoughts. It was very, um, she put family first, but country was very close. (laughs) So she was not a content stay at home mother. She would have all four Boston newspaper in front of her and read those every day as she was mothering the children. Yeah. Wow. Amazing. And and thinking about, you know, a woman before her time and, and still being able to um, have an impact, right? We're, we're talking today, right? I mean, it's, um, it's amazing to hear those, to hear that, to hear that side of history. Yes. John actually wrote her from Europe and to the white house. When he got into the white house as president, he would write, I can do nothing without you. That Mm -hmm. is how much he relied on her. In fact, um, critical media, uh, wrote about her when she was the first lady and they called her mockingly, Mrs. President. Well, that didn't bother her. She just went ahead and went ahead with the policies. In fact, when John appointed somebody they didn't agree with, said, well, Abigail must have been gone that week because he made this ridiculous appointment. So it really was a feather in her cap. And she was very, very uh, well liked. John was kind of a hothead, but she was the calmer one, the charming one, but yet very, very bright. Mm -hmm. So interesting. So let's talk a little bit about maybe some of your favorite scenes from the book. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Okay. Now I have many, many scenes. In fact, as I was writing that this is odd maybe, but I could all almost picture that in a play or a movie because it was just so rich. Mm -hmm. Um, The other one I wanted to talk about was Charles at the age of nine. They sent this boy who was protesting against going to France with his father, who was a Mm -hmm. diplomat there. Mm -hmm. Well, they decided that the boys should experience France and they should experience Europe and and all these new experiences and learn the language. Well, she knew the, the, the voyage was very risky and she would probably lose communication for up to a year and that they could die at sea or British Mm -hmm. ships, of course, were after John, because if they could have got captured John on the sea, That would have been a real feather in their cap to shoot him, you know, Mm -hmm. in front of his son. Well, the boys became very um, mistreated at a European school. So Charles begged to go home back to his mother. So he was sent back, but the ship was lost without any trace. It just vanished. So for a year, Abigail really nearly lost her mind. She Mm. she could hardly sleep. She could hardly eat. Um, She just sobbed every, every nearly every day and she received no information about the whereabouts of son for one year if you can even imagine yeah and she would go down to the ha- harbor at boston looking for the ship 
or mm -hmm. waiting to hear from him. So she experienced many, many, many trials and had to bury four of her children before she died. Wow. So, yeah. yeah, it was. And now her daughter at about 42 uh, thought she had breast cancer and she was correct. So she comes down to Boston knowing her mother's really hands on and is going to get the best medical attention because she knew, I don't know if you've heard of Dr. Benjamin Rush, who's like the father of psychology. Well, anyway, the three surgeons performed the mastectomy without anesthesia oh my in goodness. the room next to John and Abigail's room. And they cared for her. And of course she was, she was a very stoic soul, but two years later, the cancer came back mm -hmm. and she died. So that is when Abigail said, that my life is over. I can, I can never smile again. I just can't go on. But eventually she gathers it up, gets her spirit back and does what she can to help the nation. Mm -hmm. So, and followed her son, John Quincy, of course, who then became president, but she never lived to see it, but she did leave, live to see him secretary of state. And that was the stepping stone to the next presidency at that time. But characters like Jefferson became her very best friend when she went over to France. And she really had not a love affair, but she really admired George Washington. Mm -hmm. And another friend was his wife, Martha and Dolly Madison. And Paul Revere actually carried some of her letters to John. So it's, it's kind of, it's, it's incredible how many of these founders and all these names that, that she, she knew and related with, and they really enjoyed her. Mm -hmm. I'm sure at a dinner, they would rather sit next to her than John. <laughs> right. right. And, and, you know, as I hear you talk about the story and her, her life, I mean, there was so much tragedy, but also so much perseverance and so much, um, you know, maybe feeling like you can't get up and go on, but then finding the strength to be able to do so. Yeah. And it was through her faith. And she would say, why would we expect God to only give us roses and not thorns? Mm -hmm. You know, everybody is going to have this, but it was grandchildren died. She helped to raise grandchildren even. Wow. And she helped to raise a two-year-old niece to, into adulthood. So uh, she was blessed and and she understood that, but she really didn't like the pomp and circumstance of meeting the king and queen of England. She didn't like the having to give these fancy dinners every every week. It was difficult for her. And she had many uh, physical like handicaps. She would get rheumatism and be in bed for a week, and then they would um, bloodlet, and she would become weaker. But back then, they thought taking this blood was going to make her stronger, and she would spend a month in bed. And if her mm -hmm. eyes were bad, which often happened after the smallpox vaccination or inoculation, then she would go in her room for days and put a dark cloth over her head because her eyes were so severely um, hurt. Yeah. Wow. wow. You know, guess, and they yeah. didn't have any modern medicine. So right. people died young and very seldom did they live to old age. You know, they called her husband bald and toothless and crippled and and that really hurt her. If, mm -hmm. if she, she would say, if he is wounded, I bleed. Oh. And, and it was even more so with the child, with John Quincy, would they make fun of him? That would really do her in for a while. You know, that was painful to, for, the, for the family to watch. Right. When, when they make fun of their father, who, is, who has still a very sharp mind. Right. And even, um, again, through the, the tragedy of all of it, um, it sounds like there's so much love that was um, at the forefront as well. Love for family, love for country. Um, yeah, she was very, she was very bold. Uh, do you want me to read a, a short comment of hers to John in 1776? Sure. Now, remember, women's opinions were neither elicited nor accepted. Right. But when she got a, a pen in her hand, watch out. So she writes <laughs> to John. In the new code of laws, which I suppose it will be necessary for you to make, I desire you would remember the ladies, that is her most famous quote, mm -hmm. and be more generous to them than your ancestors. Don't put such unlimited power into the hands of husbands. Remember, all men would be tyrants if they could. If particular care and attention is not paid to the ladies, we are determined to foment a rebellion. 
and will not hold ourselves bound by any laws in which we have no voice or representation. So in other words, she was already preparing Susan B. Anthony for what is what what is coming. These women are already upset that uh, you, you don't include. And she was very much upset in 1776 that we would not ex, not give freedom to the slaves. Right. When we ourselves are, are searching for freedom from British tyranny, why right. are you neglecting them? Well, if you read this book, you will understand why the founding fathers backs were against the wall and they had to postpone this for another time, mm-hmm. right or wrong. Of course it was wrong, but in order to get this passed unanimously, it had to be done. Mm. But I mean, she was, uh, it, it bothered her to see slaves at the white house when she went further South. Right. Of course, John and her never owned a slave. They were very much abolitionists mm-hmm. and their and Quincy became a staunch abolitionist. Mm-hmm. Wow. Okay. So, so interesting. So interesting. Um, just a couple of questions before we wrap up here. What would you say was the most challenging part of writing the book for you? I already touched on it. I think to record the tragic catastrophes, such as the baby being born, stillborn, the mastectomy without anesthetic, bearing four children, uh, I would locate a really rich quotation and then and then I'd start sobbing over mm-hmm. it, you know? Yeah. So the, the one that really got me to was her son, John Quincy, was a diplomat in Russia when she was dying. She just begged him to please come home so I could see you one more time. Mm-hmm. So it was these separations that were, were very difficult for her. The, did you ask the most fun? And that was going to be my next question. What was the most fun or what did you like the best about? Uh, okay, to portray the, the energy, wit, and wisdom of this and generosity she did not attend john's inauguration because she was caring for his dying for her dying mother-in-law john's mother was dying and her niece was dying so even though she would have loved to have been there and delight in it she stayed back to take care of these people who were dying now i think it's important that people alive today especially with the division in our country that hopefully we'll heal be enlightened on the ideals behind the creation of our nation. And it is such an exciting story. It's every American story. Mm-hmm. Mm. Okay. Could I put one more thing in here yet? Sure. Go right ahead. All right. Now you think that there are very few people who know Abigail and hopefully they'll become more educated. But in 2016, which is only five years ago, during the presidential debates, the candidates were asked, what woman would you like to see on the $10 bill? Well, with conviction, Governor Chris Christie responds, our country wouldn't be here without John Adams. And he would not have been able to do it without Abigail. So that kind of tells you about it. You know, Thomas Jefferson mm-hmm. said, said we wouldn't be we wouldn't have gotten our freedom without John Adams because he was the, the firebrand to push everybody. This is what we have to do. We can't take this any longer. All these taxes and they took over the courts. They, they plugged mm-hmm. up the harbors. So anyway, and, and his right hand and his ballast was Abigail. Mm, yeah, such an amazing story, uh, Mary. Thank you so much for being on the show this week and talking about your book. Wild Colts Make the Best Horses, The Intrepid Life of Abigail Adams. Would you like, is there anything else you'd like to leave the listeners with this week to make sure that they know about your book? She just is such a dynamic and charming person. She would, when she would leave for France, which she was definitely afraid of being uh, over the ocean, but she went because John begged her. Uh, People were lined up at the harbor to see her off, not John just her alone yeah. so things like that really make you sh- show you how well liked she was so thank you for this opportunity and to the listeners yes thank you mary for joining us today and being our guest on books on air you can find more about mary's book wild colts make the best horses the intrepid life of abigail adams on amazon and i'll link to mary's website in the book in the show notes so be sure to check that out You've been listening to the Books on Air podcast brought to you by webtalkradio.net. You can also hear this podcast on Spotify, iHeartRadio, Stitcher, and Apple Podcasts. 
I'm Sloan Fremont, and I hope you'll join us for the next Books on Air podcast. Remember, you never know who's going to be here, and you never know what we're going to talk about. Thank you so much for listening. Thank you.